So next up will be Jeff Pulver, the original founder of the voice I over IP protocol, which is how we communicate over voice, over Skype, and other telecommunication methods. Please welcome Jeff Pulver. Good morning. So um, I'm Jeff. I'd like to first thank you for the invitation to be here. And um, what I'm going to be talking about today will, be, will make sense a few minutes after I start talking. But the, uh, I'm just curious, how many people here are developers? And how many people here are, um, are students? OK, so this is, talk is really for the students and the developers. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, voice over IP happened by accident, but it was a wonderful accident. It was a good mistake. Um, I don't know if I should certain, stand in a certain place and not get feedback, but let me just bring you back a little bit of time. So when I was growing up, the internet didn't really exist. And I was in a world where um, I had a need to connect to people, but I don't know if any of you ever dealt with loneliness. I don't know if you ever felt by yourself. I don't know if you ever felt that you, you had maybe certain friends, but you didn't trust them even when you were young. But um, that was my life. And the one thing that changed my life happened when I was nine years old. And that thing that happened when I was nine literally saved my life many years later. And it all ties together and ends up with blockchain. But just a little bit of reference. Uh, one of the things that we don't have enough in the world these days is trust. You know, in America, we, we suffer from robocalling. In, in, in America, you know, like people calling your phones and no one picks up the phone anymore because we don't know who's the authentic originator of the call. Um, and that's a shame. And the reality is, is that trust has been broken across all lines of our lives, from the social media side with deep fakes, from our communications, and, and, and anyone who's active on social networks, people get catfished, is because we don't necessarily understand who to trust. You know, fundamentally, one of the basic foundations of blockchain, of course, is trust, immutable trust, where you can engage in business with people who you don't have to know, but because you, you could do trustless business. And so I'll get to that later, but just understand that one of the challenges we're facing is, is, is bringing trust back and I do believe that one of the salvations for the communications industry is blockchain. So that when people use a phone to do business, when you call into a call center, they know who you are. Once you're validated, once you're authenticated, just once on a chain, you're done. You never have to verify yourself ever again. But my story started off when I was about nine. And um, my dad had a brother, my uncle Fred, who uh, waited for me at, um, when I got home from school. And I had no idea what was going on, but my dad's brother, my uncle, took me to his office, showed me around, and sat me in his office, which was a pretty small room. But this room, though, had this box on his, and he had like a, two chairs in front of the desk, and he had a chair behind him, and this box was sitting on his um, desk, and he flipped a switch and it started to glow, like glow. And when he, when he, when he turned it on, all I heard was noise. Of course, my uncle heard voices. I didn't know that. And very cryptically, my uncle sits there, and he speaks in a language I don't know. He says, CQ, CQ, this is K2QQ, I'm calling CQ. And he repeats it for a minute. Now, in, in the language that he speaks, the letter C, the letter Q means CQ. Like, I'm seeking you. I'm seeking a contact. Says this for a minute. Let's go with a microphone, and for an hour, I'm mesmerized listening to my uncle talk to people all over the world, where he simply said his name was Fred, he was from New York, and he gave a signal report. And it didn't matter what country the person was from, everybody spoke English. And at the end of this, and I was nine, mind you, I told my uncle, you know, you have the cure for my loneliness. Please give me your radio so I can take it home. So it didn't matter about what happened at school before or after, because before school I could have friends, after school I could have friends, I don't have to see these people, I just want to talk to them. And he said, no. And, I, and, I, and I, I, this went back and forth several times. And I, I said, but I'm your favorite nephew. And he said, no. And then I asked him, why? Because he said you had to be licensed. And I didn't understand. 
but, but when I was nine, he explained to me that to be able to use this radio, I had to um, study physics. I had to pass an exam about college level physics, maybe not Oxford level physics, but certainly American, uh, uh, high, at least better than high school physics. And I had to learn Morse code, I had to learn the rules and regulations to be an amateur radio operator. And so I didn't take that radio home with me, but by the time I was 12, I had my license to communicate. I like to think I haven't shut up since. But the ability to communicate for me opened up a world that I did not know. And, um, and that was the journey that started all the work that I would end up doing. The passion to connect, the passion to communicate, and, and this, a lot of things that I learned o along the time, along the way. And, you know, several things which people don't always talk about is intuition and premonitions, being able to understand the future even if you cannot explain it, and certainly um, appreciating moments. And you know, the, the, one, one of the secrets about being a university student is 10 years from now, you don't change too much. Your responsibilities grow. And as you get older in life, you are the same person you are today. Your friends may be different, but you, you just are the same person. And, and so rather than people telling you grow up, it's not about growing up. It's about accepting who you are. And it's about understanding what that means. And um, in my life, I've dealt with different, different um, uh, demons. The biggest one I ever dealt with is, is inertia. That is to say that I know I have to do something, but something's blocking me from doing it, so I just don't, until something forces its hand upon me, in which case I'm saved. And uh, you know, with, with me, at least with finding friends, it was okay, because I had to become a ham operator. And, and that was cool, and the one thing that it did do is it created this relationship between me and the US government because they are the ones who license uh, amateur radio operators. And um, the one thing that I really love doing as a ham operator, and, and I appreciate this is a culture that many of you may not know, but some of you may have relatives, who, particularly if you're into engineering, because radio is radio, is the ability to interconnect the radio and a telephone. So you know, in America, and I'm, I know across Europe, 30, 40 years ago, there was something called long distance where if you were to call someone across England, if you were to call someone across Europe, it cost money. And it wasn't just pennies or fractional pennies, but it was pounds, and sometimes many pounds per minute. So us ham operators were pretty clever types, so we'd use the radio to bypass the long distance, and then amateur operators would then do a handoff locally to make a local phone call. Pretty nice. And while you're limited to having only friends and family use this, it was a nice thing to do. Now, flash forward 20 years, and I'm working on Wall Street. I was fortunate to have sold my business to a company, which I ended up working in the World Trade Center. And uh, in 1995, I discovered the software that let me talk on the internet, much like a ham operator does, uh, except all I needed was a microphone, a computer, and connectivity. And um, when I first started using the software, it was called actually iPhone. Most people think iPhone came from Apple in 2007, in reality, the first iPhone came from Israel in 1995. But it, wasn't a, it was a piece of software that just worked. And uh, while I had no direct affiliation with the company, I created a mailing list so that when we're not talking on the internet, we could get to know each other. And um, someone along the way asked, is it possible to interconnect a telephone and a computer? I immediately said yes, because I took out my old phone patch and it worked. So in, 19, in October 1995, I did something crazy. I very accidentally launched what became the first telephone network on the internet called Free World Dial-Up. It was free, it connected the world, and it ran on dial-up, and it went viral. Now mind you, back in 95, there were only 16 million people on the internet, like, like billions you have today, but it, it really started getting the phone companies around the world thinking that they're screwed. <laughs> because we finally have a way to put them in their place because something is gonna change, but you know, Publicly, this was a toy. They didn't have to worry about it yet. But free will dial-up grew in user base, and then something crazy happened. In March of 96, 300 phone companies went to the US government and asked for two simple things. The sale and use of internet telephony software to be banned in America, and the makers of the software to be regulated as phone companies. What do you think? Should happen? Yes? No? Uh, I w as the moderator of the mailing list, I was laughing my ass off, like, this is crazy. 
But people were taking this seriously and they looked to me to do something. Now, I had a day job. My night job was much more fun running free will dial up, but I didn't have any position to do anything, but um, lesson number one, you know, you, you're limited to the only by what you don't know what you can do. So 10 days later, I created a trade association called the Voice on the Net Coalition. And I'm very happy to say that this petition never came to fruition. Um, but what happened to me is uh, the company I worked for, which actually had an office in London, um, they were going through management turnover, and the, uh, the founder of the, the, the CEO of the company was having a fight with the founder. And in May of 96, there was an article in the New York Times about the fight that was on page one, and on page eight was a picture of me talking about internet telephony. Um, I'm talking about the passions about how to connect. And um, that became my exit strategy. So I lost my job in uh, July of 96, but it saved my life. And what I ended up doing is I ended up uh, starting a conference that brought the people together uh, that were passionate about voice and video on the internet. And we explored the boundaries of what was possible simply by connecting stuff together. Um, I, saved, I say it saved my life is because um, I, at 8.48 in the morning, I had the kind of job that I would have been at my desk. And um, I started this conference business in uh, 96. And in um, 2001, I sold it. Somehow I managed to sell the conference the day before 9-11. So, so I always tell people being lucky is okay. That never, never apologize for your luck. But at the same time, um, you know, Canner lost 700 people. Uh, I lost 400 people that I knew, that I worked with. And my, my family got a phone call that I died. And, and that kind of like set a tone to me as far as like what, what matters in life in terms of how to be, how to understand yourself and what, what truly matters overall. And it comes down to trust. You know, in some cases, it's trust yourself, trust your intuition, uh, allow yourself to, you know, not be bounded by other people's um, misunderstandings. So when I worked on Wall Street, I, it was in 1994. I asked some friends, some colleagues, about an idea that I had to do web-based email. Everyone told me it was a stupid idea, literally. Then a, a few months later, I asked some other people, what about doing online mortgage brokering? They said, that was a stupid idea. And um, so I didn't do it. Then I realized I needed new friends because I was letting other people gate me for what I was going to do. Now, why did I allow strangers who didn't have my, best, my vested interest tell me what my future should be? Because I relied, because I didn't have confidence in myself to make that happen. And, and the thing is, is that eventually you understand a few things. That in America, today is Father's Day, and I could tell you that my dad did his best when he was alive to teach me many things. One of them is that worrying is a waste of time. That, you know, there are things in your life you can control. Own those. Everything else, let go. Also, if you don't ask, the answer is no. That if, if, you, you, know, if you don't ask, then it will not happen. And, and, and so in 2003, I woke up after the effect, I woke up, I, had, I was fortunate to have started this conference business, I sold it, I bought it back, which is a different conversation. But I had this premonition that the phone companies in America would want to own broadband. In other words, take away innovation, take away the opportunity for anyone who wanted to write code to uh, innovate and create services. So I asked my attorney friends what, they could, what I could do. So they said, well, you could file a petition. You could ask the government to, for clarity. Um, and so I asked, I very simply said, okay, guys, um, I would like to have clarity that voice communication that starts on the broadband internet for not to be regulated as telecom. So we did this. It took five weeks. We filed it February 5th, 2003. I then asked my attorney, so when is the fight going to begin? They said, fight? You know, if you, hear Martian, if you hear Martian signals in your ears, uh, you could file a petition for the government to block those signals, but there's a chance they'll never act on it. But be happy that you submitted the petition, that you collected your thoughts. Well, P.S., be careful what you wish for, because 10 days later, this petition went out for public comment, and after a year, 
on February 12, 2004, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, issued something called the Pulver Order. And, the, and this is why, for the last 19 and a half years, most people around the world have been able to, for free, speak on things like Telegram and Skype and, 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 and uh, WhatsApp and Zoom. Uh, and Teams and many other platforms because it's free. So have any of you benefited from that? No? You're welcome. And, and, and the thing is, is that my vested interest in doing that petition was based on, on, a, on energy that, and, and understanding that if you didn't stand up to affect change, um, you know, you, nothing happens. And, and if you flow this back into blockchain and stuff, it's that, you know, there's a lot of, um, there are three words that I like to use, fear, um, fear, greed, and disruption. When there's fear, greed, and disruption in the air, um, change can happen. In America, typically that means is that incumbents hire lobbyists to uh, prevent innovators. And in the area, and the thing is, it, it, with, with communication law, it goes back to the 1930s, although there was an 86 Act. In securities law in America, it goes back to 1934 and 1936. And you're effectively always reading tea leaves because the US government hasn't had the uh, ability or desire to provide clarity in the regulation of, uh, of, of, um, of, sec of digital securities uh, and many other things. And uh, I, I, I sit today on a, uh, as an advisor to the government of Bermuda, which in 2018 provided clarity with their own digital, right, digital act. And you know, for people who want to work with regulators, you know, regulators are not evil people. They're there attempting to enforce things to save other people from being scammed. And the, the reality is in the crypto world, you know, there's been a lot of greed. I mean, the one thing that really hurt everybody is greed. It's not that the technology doesn't work, is that the technology sometimes brings out bad actors. And there are bad actors in every industry. The early days of the internet had lots of fraud. The early days in almost every sector brings it out, but, but it somehow it's accelerated in, um, in the world of crypto. However, when I look to the future of communications, I'm very bullish on a few things. I really believe in, um, in where smart contracts can take us. In, in the world that I'm living in, I look at it as smart communications being able to use smart contracts to create programmable, not just programmable securities, but programmable communications to do things never before practical or possible. I believe in it so much that um, in August, I'm going to Rwanda and I'm hosting a, uh, a, a, a co an event to, to hopefully have an impact in Africa to bring developers and entrepreneurs together to explore the intersection and nexus of blockchain and, and telecom and provide an opportunity for people who are creative to be seen and to be heard and to connect um, to their future. And you know, for me, uh, as an entrepreneur, and I, I, you don't, may not know me, but I've invested in over 400 startups and uh, I learned along the way how to take having fun seriously, but it all comes down to each person that you know, the, the key to success is the community that you bring together, the ability to empower people to listen, to be heard, to connect and to share with each other and, you know, it's moments, like, like the thing about 9-11 that hit me the most, besides losing all these people, was the fact that my sister got a phone call that I died. Now, the, the fact that my sister waited 16 years to tell me that was kind of weird. But it, it kind of like brought home the fact that life is very special. And the thing about voice, you know, I look at voice in terms of the killer app. No matter what great applications you come up with, there's so much metadata in someone's voice, particularly in, in times of crisis, to say I love you to someone, to say to I love you, that I'm okay, that things are all good. And particularly when there's an event happening and you can't get hold of someone, there's a lot of tension, people would pay a premium to get through, whether it's a, to a loved one or to a business partner. And the thing is, when someone dies, it's very hard to say I love you to them. It's kind of, you miss the point. So, you know, Having lived through that, I'm someone who's learned to not be shy about ex expressing myself. You know, I, I like to think that I've learned to take the walls out away from uh, what, you know, of how to communicate, but most importantly, not to, not, I'm not afraid to be disruptive. And if you're sitting here today at this blockchain conference, I, I hope and I pray 
that if you have an idea that's incredibly disruptive, that you go for it. That you know, innovation happens on its own. If you have to get consensus from other people to validate your idea, if that's the way the world worked, we never would have innovators. We would never see change. It's those people that have the guts to innovate and stand alone and have no one else around them are the ones that change the world. And I do hope that you have the strength to find your strength, to understand who you are, and know that nothing is impossible. The only time things are impossible is when you don't manifest them. And so before I end, I'll just say that if you want to make your dreams happen, it's on you. And, and what works for me is to write it down, speak it, be witnessed, and when I close my eyes, see myself accomplishing what it is I say I want to do. Most people cannot manifest dreams because when they close their eyes, they actually don't see it happening. But when you allow yourself the possibility of that success, it's magic. Call it what you want, but, in the, but I believe every one of you have superpowers. Every one of you can make dreams happen, but it's on you to do it. I'm Jeff Pulver. Thank you very much. No, 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 I, no. Let the nice man clean your window. Oh, oh. Give him the 50. Here. Yep, okay. In 100 meters, turn left. Oh, I have to be at the airport in half an hour. In 50 meters, turn left. No, I can't, I have to. Turn left. Okay. Call your mother. Hello? Mum? Hello, dear. Mum, the GPS is telling me what to do. What do you mean? How's dad? Stop the car. Take off your shoes and socks. Tomorrow, take the day off work. This is ridiculous. I can't. I can't take the day take off. Take the day off work. I can't. I'm just too busy. You have reached your destination.